It's a global PV powerhouse. Hello and welcome to Shanghai, China for the 10th SNEC trade show. I'm Jonathan Gifford, the editor-in-chief of PV Magazine. Now, while the Chinese downstream segment has grown at rapid pace in the last couple of years, it still remains the beating heart of global PV production. So let's have a look at the landscape and take a look under the hood at some of the latest trends that are making a splash in global manufacturing here in China today. So I think that after a very strong Q1, some of the module makers here are a bit desperate. Um, they're trying to come up with something new. A lot of them are, ex have been expanding very strongly. So first of all, outside China, to dodge trade tariffs. So they've, they've been setting up in Vietnam, Malaysia, Thailand, India. Um, and of course, they've been investing in, in perk, monoperk, and, and different technologies to make their modules more efficient and more sellable. Um, I know that Horaeus has been involved for some time in a, in a, in a larger perk project um, in Germany. Um, Perk, how, how, how deep is the penetration now um, in terms of your suppliers and you're seeing in China? Yeah, we see now Perk uh, on the range of 7 gigawatt being installed worldwide. We see the pace extremely fast uh, uh, with the further growth. Companies do feel that if they don't have enough Perk capacity, they have a real disadvantage. Price point wise, they can market it 10% higher or even lower. Uh, it's always good for their gross margin, for their image. So they are very eager to, to uh, bring PERS to the market. And it's competition from some of the Chinese equipment suppliers, like those around us here in this hall, that is really causing some challenges for the European and US more established PV production equipment suppliers. Can they compete on price? Can they stay ahead of the technology game? And more importantly, will the pie be big enough to ensure that there's a slice for everyone? I think things get sorted out. There are a few weaker players. They have been too much burdened by their financial debts, others managing their debts better. Um, what we don't see is that any capacity in China goes offline. So eventually some or other weaker candidates may be restructured. Maybe even the nameplate outside the FAP will be changed. Who knows? But the factory inside will be operative uh, all the time. So I see really the big uh, destiny for China fully ambitious to go to increase factories and capacity here, but also in Southeast Asia. So they're installing very fast Southeast Asia. So they are very committed to their uh, leading edge competitiveness and they will further pass it all the way down. The Chinese have been really, really good at taking a technology that exists and then deploying it and bringing the cost down. Um, I think even the Chinese themselves will admit that the, the sort of zero to one part of the uh, development is not something they are particularly uh, experienced in and, and I, I haven't seen a lot of examples of that. And so as long as you're doing something truly innovative, I believe we still very much have an edge. Yeah, I think in this position, we are, in this situation, we are somehow unique. Since we are the technology driver, there is a huge interest in what we do. Of course, this also uh, brings some competitors in, trying to copy, trying to enter this market, which we dominate in certain technologies. But since uh, all this uh, development is a huge investment in terms of R&D, uh, costs, it splits a little bit. So the success is not that big, so it keeps us a little bit in freedom with our kind of technology. 